Teenage savages go wild in a juvenile jungle of lust and lawlessness. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back once again for another fine episode of the Ferris Wheel Classic Rock Show. I am your host, co-creator and co-conspirator and the king of all kings, Ferris Good Kennedy. Lord, to the left of me, a man that always fields phone calls from Stevie Nicks and never says no to her when it's for one-nighters. <laughs> Dr. Green Clark, thank you very much. And the man to the right of me that always uses excuses that he's moving boxes, but in reality, he's actually <laughs> spending a lot of time at the Orchids of Asia, Stephen Wheeler. <laughs> Gentlemen, how are you? Great, it's wonderful to be here in this beautiful evening. Excellent. To all our listeners, so you know, we are now officially on Cap City Beats. Yeah. 7 p.m. on Wednesdays and uh, Rewind on 10 a.m. on Sundays. Great. Sunday, Sunday. Good time slots. And email us any of your suggestions, concerns, compliments, you name it. Hate mail, fan mail, we'll and take it all. compliments. Ferris Wheel, the Ferris Wheel Show at gmail.com. Okay. So anyways, gentlemen, today we're doing a show which is true to my heart. As you know, when we did our top three rock bands, Beatles and Stones were always taking the number one and two spot. And my right. third of all time has to be Van Halen. Yep. But for those of you that know me, it is Van Roth. So kids, <laughs> sit down, buckle up, and get ready for the greatest show of all time for the man who is the best showmanship best front man best entertainer of receipt, any rock and roll <laughs> band that could put freddie mercury adam lambert to shame uh, even eric clapton and elton john don't even compare you could forget about the crooners no one will ever even come close to david lee roth Paul McCartney himself cannot be as cool as David Lee Roth. David Lee Roth could have been dead and he'll still be cooler than anybody else, but thank God he's still alive. Thank God you didn't overstress the point. Right? No, That's David right. Lee Roth of Van Halen. So, let's start. Van Halen. Yeah. One of the best and most popular American hard rock heavy metal bands, primarily distinguished by the fleet fingers of guitarist Eddie Van Halen. Their 1978 debut, Van Halen, simultaneously rewrote the rules of rock guitar and hard rock in general. Guitarist Eddie Van Halen redefined what the electric guitar could do, developing a fast technique with a variety of self-taught two-handed tapping. It was widely accompanied by the vocalist David Lee Roth, who brought the role of metal singer to near performance art standards with a flair of showmanship that no one else could deny. Freddie Mercury, roll in your grave, buddy. Unfortunately, you are number two. Together, they made Van Halen into the most popular American rock and roll band of the late 70s and early 80s. And let's go down the list of a few things. Throughout the 80s, it was impossible not to hear Van Halen's instrumental technique on records that range from the heaviest metal to soft pop. Roth, unfortunately, was replaced by Hagar in 85. Hagar stayed with the band longer than Roth, helping the group remain a fixture on the top of the charts through the late 80s and early 90s. Halfway through the 90s, the group's sales began to slide, just as tensions between Hagar and Eddie began to arise. Have a lot to do with it. Mm. As the group prepped a greatest hits album, Hagar was fired. In his words, he quit. And Roth was brought back on to sing two cuts on the compilation. He was subsequently replaced by Gary Sharon, a former member of Extreme, who lasted through one album before departing. After half a decade hiatus, the band mounted a reunion tour with Hagar, who left in 2005 only to be replaced by Roth. With this reunion leading to a new album called The Different Kind of Truth, which was released in 2012. Through all the upheaval over lead vocalists, Eddie Van Halen and his prodigious talent remain the core of Van Halen. Eddie and Alex learned classical piano training when they were kids. 
Eddie learned how to play the drums, and Alex took up the guitar, eventually switching instruments. The brothers began a hard rock band called Mammoth and began playing around Pasadena, eventually meeting the legend himself, David Lee Roth, who was, the, who was singing in the Red Ball Jet. Shortly after, bassist Michael Anthony, who was singing with Snake, became a member of Mammoth. After discovering that another band had the rights to the name Mammoth, the group decided to call themselves Van Halen in 1974. What about Mammoth Snake? They could have called that. Well, they actually rejected a name called Rat Salad. <laughs> what about Rat's Ass? Well, uh, they was no good it. either. Right? No. Uh, Ian, you know the guy named Hyam? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a very gentle soul. That's right. So, 1977, Kiss Gene Simmons financed a demo recording session for Van Halen after seeing them at the Starwood Club. On the strength of Simmons' recommendation, Mo Austin and Ted Templeman signed Van Halen to Warner Brothers, releasing the band's debut album the following year. Okay. Van Halen became a hit due to strong word of mouth, constant touring, and support from AOR Radio. Within three months, the album had gone gold, and five months later, it went platinum. It would eventually sell over six million copies, thanks to the album Rock Staples, You Really Got Me, Jamie's Crying, and Running With The Devil. Van Halen 2 was released in 1979. It continued the band's success as Dance, The Night Away, became their first top 20 single. Women and Children First was released in 1980, didn't have any chart and singles, but was a success on the album charts, reaching number six. The band supported the album with their first headlining international arena tour and were quickly on their way to being superstars. Released in 1981, Fair Warning wasn't quite as popular as their previous records, yet it still peaked at number six. Diver Down, released in 1982, was a huge hit, spawning a number 12 cover of Roy Orbison's Oh Pretty Woman. And that was reached. And that song actually reached number three on the charts. Okay. While all their previous albums were successful, Van Halen didn't become superstars until 1984 when their album 1984 became an across the board smash, released on New Year's Day in. 1984. 84, okay. And it rocketed to the number two on the strength of the number one single, Jump. Like many songs in the album, Jump was driven by Eddie's new synthesizer. And while Roth was initially reluctant to use electronics, the expansion of the group's sound was widely praised. Throughout 1984, Van Halen gained steam as I'll Wait and Panama became top 15 singles and Hot for Teacher became a radio and MTV staple. Though many critics suspected Hagar wouldn't be able to sustain Van Halen's remarkable success, his first album with the band, 1986's 5150, was a huge hit, reaching number one and spawning the hit singles Why Can't This Be Love, Dreams, and Love Walks In. Released in 1988, OU812 was just as successful earning stronger reviews than its predecessor and generating the hits When It's Love and Finish What You Started. For Unlawful Carnal Knowledge, released in 1991, was another, another number one hit, partially due to the hit MTV video for Right Now. Van Halen followed the album with their first live record, the double album Van Halen Live, Right Here, Right Now, and I don't know how you say it in English, but it had on the cover, Le Sacre Car. So it had, and my buddy Mark's mom says to me, she said to her son Mark when we were listening to the album, she goes, why is there a picture of Le Sacre Car? And in French, it's like a picture of a statue of like Jesus okay. uh, or Mother heart. Mary. Yeah. So, and his parents being very religious, they asked why that question. Because they recite verses from the New Testament. Yeah. That's why. And now I'd like to... Bring it to where this cocktail music is going. Okay, okay. To a good friend of mine. I'm comfortable with that. I'm very comfortable in that space. Who likes to to knock on something? Is it time for Ian's knock? It is. Oh, hello. And 
now it's time for Ian's Knock. A little segment we like to call Affairs with Rock Show, where Ian himself rant and rave about books, reviews, musicians, artists, people, or whatever just does not go his way back then. Who knows? You might be on Ian's Knock, 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 Knock. Rock stars are generally <coughs> annoying people. You've written this letter, and I agree with you. It comes with the territory. You're not alone in hating most of them. They're hateable. In fact, this is a list from a major music magazine who agrees with you. Now it's from 2013, and it's Rolling Stone magazine that makes a list out of anything. But this one makes sense. It's called the 10 Most Annoying Rock Star Behaviors, and they take aim at people on stage. Let's get into it. Number one, show up ridiculously late. You know, they, they, they say that rock stars are on accounts. That's true. They don't have to be precise about everything. But, you know, in one case, like Lauren Hill had them waiting for, what, two or three hours? And Guns N' Roses is no, were notorious in their heyday for being, like, four hours after the ticket time. I think that actually started a riot in Montreal back in the day. 93. Congratulations. <laughs> what a bunch of boneheads. Because it went on for half an hour. Axl Rose went on. Told everyone to F off, gave the finger, and <laughs> peaced out. Wow, that's a, what a perform, what a pro. Good stuff. You know what I mean? Here's, and yet, more, here's more of my money. <laughs> Group number two, exclude key members. Yeah, Bill, Miss True, with the point here is Christian McVie. And she came back, but she quit with Mac. Bill Wyman never went back to the Stones. Uh, that's It can be infuriating when people um, show up in a band and the original members aren't there and they fake it. Like Don Felder, who wrote Hotel California, gets booted out and kept out of the Eagles, even with their um, uh, Hall of Fame um, appearance. It's just so stupid. But one of the worst is Kiss, of course, our buddy Gene Simmons, who cut Peter, Chris, and Ace freely. And he had new guys dress up in the old makeup. But, okay, he's a genius, I admit it, for making money. But in terms of rock, it's just bizarre. Number three, play too much from a new album. You know, and really, how many concerts have you been to and they start playing all their new stuff and it just dies off? Not just because it makes the kind of inferior music, but if you don't know the song, you can't sing along. Live performance is often about singing along, clapping, stomping your feet, whatever. Now, on the other side of that, numbers number four, only perform your hits. And the guy from Rolling Stone makes a point, quote, Tom Petty fell into this rut for much, much of the 2000s. He has enough songs to fill out an arena, but that doesn't guarantee, and that guarantees rather they'll come back two years later, but it gets tarred pretty quickly. Now, Petty himself wised up on his recent theater tour. Play number five, play anything resembling a medley. Yeah, medleys were overdone. They were really big in the late 60s and the 70s, but it's annoying when you hear 30 seconds of your favorite song and then they cut into another, uh, another song. Prince did it all the time. You can see a concert he gave in uh, England, in London, I think, and it's super annoying. So he'll cut in from When Doves Fly, Cry to Purple Rain to all over the place. Uh, he can do it because he's Prince, but it's still annoying, and it, it's not why you want to see a concert. Number six, ignore the music of your beloved former band. John Fogarty did that because he didn't want to pay his much-hated uh, record owner, Saul Zantz, money on royalties and himself, incidentally. Um, so you get that all the time. You have to, uh, Paul McCartney, when McCartney quit the Beatles and started to tour, he wouldn't play Beatles songs. Uh, number what? Number seven, play perverse arrangements of your songs. Bob Dylan is the most guilty. I mean, listen to Live at Book It On. He's just doing reggae versions of these old folk songs. It's really hairy. Number eight, never vary the set list. The writer here makes a point that it's not a Broadway show. You can, you, can, you can shake it up. Just because one set list works, don't hang on to it forever. Elton John got criticized for that. Number nine, solo. Don't do solos if you aren't Neil Peart, Ginger Baker, or Eric Clapton. Joey Kramer took a drum solo uh, often in uh, Aerosmith, and he scared people. It's not worth it unless you're outstanding. Number 10, squeeze every possible penny out of the fans. I went, once went to a Rolling Stone concert, and I mean, you couldn't turn around without people barking and selling things at you. It's, uh, 
you know, and the guy makes the point, if you sell $400 tickets, you should be on the damn stage and not just in the top you know, five rows. And if you do the, one of these meet and greets, uh, if you're paying $1,000, you should even get more than a handshake and a photo, okay? And don't moan about scalping because paperless tickets are coming in. This isn't just an idealistic position. Soaking your fans is also bad business because people get bad vibes from it, right? So wise up, rockers. And that has been a kind of Ian's knock that's once removed the Rolling Stone. Thank you. And have a wonderful evening. If you want more knocks, yeah. let Ian know at the Ferris Wheel Show at gmail.com. Oh, God, God. My question is to yeah. Ian, how would Jerry Lewis sing the first five <laughs> words of Stairway to Heaven? Well, there's a lady <laughs> who we know. <laughs> it's a good thing to know about that, I think. Hey, Dean, I'm scared of Goyles. You say something like that. <laughs> that You're is easy, little buddy. Like Gene, they make me nervous. That is perfect. Thank you. Van Halen produced 12 albums as a band. They like to title it as Van Halen's studio output consists of 12 albums. Between 1978 and 84, the band put out six records that showcased the groundbreaking guitar work of Eddie Van Halen. The leering innuendo laced lyrics of David Lee Roth and the muscular rhythm section of bassist Michael Anthony and drummer Alex Van Halen. So just for you young kids out there, just goes to show you that how much of an influence, how important it was to have David Lee Roth. Why? Because those albums kicked ass. It didn't matter. 78 to 84, it's Roth. Who cares about Hagar? Oh, wait a second. Didn't you say Hagar had some top albums selling too? Just a couple, but nothing <laughs> compared to, to Roth. But I'll get into it. So okay, I'm going to read okay. you. I'll read you the the, right. the name titles of the album, and right. we'll go from there. Okay. But before that, Roth's departure allowed Van Halen to redefine themselves with their new singer, heading into a synth-heavy, radio-friendly sound. But after four albums, only four. All of which went to number one, so they say. Yeah, so they say. They parted ways. And then Extreme's Gary Sharon took over for one album. And then there was nearly a 14 year hiatus before, oh, guess who returned? Raw. That's right, to do the last LP they ever produced in 2012. So let's recap the, uh, the history, or not the history, but the titles of the bands. Okay. Uh, First album, 78, was Van Halen. Makes sense. Number two in 79 was Van Halen 2. Oh my God, where'd they get that? In 1980, they went with Women and Children First. Okay. 1981, Fair Warning. 1982, your favorite one, Ian, Diver Down. Sounds like a Newfoundland oh, yeah. thing, right? Oh, oh Jesus, yeah. <laughs> I bought it in the St. John ones. Uh, 1984, self-titled, 1984. In 1986, Incredible. they went with 5150. 1988, OU812. In 1991, For Unlawful Carnal Knowledge. 1995, Balance. 1998, Van Halen 3. And then in 2012, A Different Kind of Truth. So let's rank the Van Halen albums from worst to best. There's no real consensus on the Van Halen catalog. For most fans, how you rank the group's records has a lot to do with which side you're on. In the David Lee Roth versus Sammy Hagar debate, and putting together a fair worst oh, I heard best it was a list master debate too. Yeah. <laughs> that takes into account each lineup's separate strengths is easier said than done. But worst in the context of one word of the world's greatest rock bands does not exist. Necessarily, it does not exist in the sense that it means bad. It's just the rankings of how they had it, and it could change tomorrow. So, let's go. Number 12. Well, Van Halen 3. So, poor Gary Sharon, he's the last on the list. Yeah, Sharon, yeah. All right. Number 11, Balance. Number 10, For Unlawful Carnal Knowledge. Number 9. A different number kind of number truth. Number nine. Number, number nine. Number, number eight. Oh, you eight one two. Number seven. Ian, your personal favorite. 
Diver, Diver down. Diver okay. Down. <laughs> Number six, 5150. So before we get into the top five, I want to emphasize to our listeners that now we're entering the Roth era. Anything how you do it Roth is in the top five. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I say. It's what the statistics are telling you. The facts are right here. So, number five, Van Halen 2. Number four, women and children first. Number three, fair warning. Number two, 1984. And number one, the debut album, which is Van Halen. Okay. You like that? I love it. So, now let's go with the top ten Van Halen songs with Sammy Hagar. A.K.A. Van Hagar. All right. So number 10, Cabo Wabo, which is from OU812. And I believe you said you had a yeah, bar. He, or... Well, he no, he founded a vodka company, which he sold, I think, for $60 million a little while ago, called Cabo Wabo, yeah. So he's doing all right. He's not hurting. Uh, yeah. Number 9, When It's Love, from the OU812 album. Number 8, Top of the World. From the four unlawful carnal knowledge. Not the world, man. Uh, number seven, <laughs> Love Walks In from 5150. Number six, Pound Cake from Four Unlawful Carnal Knowledge. Okay. Uh, number five, The Best of Both Worlds. Number four, well, let me rephrase that. Number five actually is from the 5150, Best of Both Worlds. Number four, finish what you started from the 0812. Finish what you started. Uh, from the 5150 album, which is number three, Why Can't This Be Love? Number two, from the four unlawful carnal knowledge, is the song right now. And then number one for Van Hagar is Dreams from the 5150 album. So now that we're done with those, let's go to where it really matters the most. So... The top 10 Van Halen songs with none other than David Lee Roth. I've never heard of them. Okay. Better known as Diamond Dave. Where? From Indiana. Why? Because the greatest musicians like John Mellencamp and no Kenny there. Aronoff come from Indiana. So let's fire them off. Number 10. Eruption from Van Halen. Number 9. Romeo Delight from Women and Children First. Number 8. On Fire from Van Halen. Number seven, Little Guitars from your favorite album, Ian. Diver Down. Diver Down. Number six, Panama from the album 1984. Number five, Dance the Night Away from Van Halen 2. Number four, Unchained from the album Fair Warning. Number three, yes. Hot for Teacher from the album 1984. Number two, Running with the Devil from the debut album Van Halen and number one from Everybody Wants Some from the album Women and Children First and that is from all the top Van Roth albums. David Lee Roth, Diamond Dave. When you all hear them like that, it just sounds like he, he's telling you about a school trip that went really bad really quick. <laughs> or really well. Or really well. <laughs> David Lee Roth. Well, very good. Excellent. Thank you. You know, and as I consider that, I consider Van Halen, of course, to give him the time period, was all on vinyl, right? Great vinyl case. Oh, hello. The music at night. It sounds bright on Wheeler's turntable. He shines a light. He keeps his vinyl in sight and gives you his magnificent review. Now here's a clue we have for you. It's time for Wheeler's vinyl review. Yes, sir. We're, today we're reviewing vinyl flooring. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really good because it's more important than these damn albums. Exactly. No, no, of course not. We're talking about Metallica and the San Francisco Symphony putting out S&M 2. Sounds like a sex tape. Uh, kind of. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> some, pe some people are finding it orgasmic. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> kind of like you when you go to the orchids of Asia. <laughs> well, yeah. The, the less said, the better. Because uh, this, we don't want a PG-13 rating. 
Uh, so the general feeling was on September 6, 2019, which was a Friday for those of you who are into those kinds of details, uh, that there was something happening at the Chase Center that was going to be historic. Uh, and this is because it was the hometown heroes Metallica reuniting after 20 years with the San Francisco Symphony and producing yet another amazing album if we could call it metal classical fusion, I don't know if it's <laughs> if there's a category for it. MCF mikf mikf mikf. Uh, this is actually a very interesting set because it opens up with the symphony orchestra going through the Ecstasy of Goal by Morricone, the mm, great yeah, yeah. great soundtrack composer, uh, before going into the classics of Metallica's catalog, starting with the Call of Cthulhu. Uh, and they just go on, and it's it's a really interesting mix, because you have things like some Prokofiev symphony, which is kind of the heavy metal. Of <laughs> the it's classic. bizarre, it works. It's so bizarre, it works. And, of course, for those of you who are Metallica fan, you cannot have these kinds of albums without Master of Puppets, Nothing Else Matters, and, of course, the Ode to Nightmares, Enter Sandman. <laughs> And it's one of those times where, like the doctor said, it's so weird it works. Yeah, it's bizarre. Enter Sandman beside Prokyo. Okay, that might work. I don't know. No, exactly. That's probably, but that's their best album, though. The It's a black album. It's just exactly. called Metallica. Everyone refers to the black album. This doesn't even sound called the black album. It's just Metallica. Exactly. <laughs> so I've, what I can say for, uh, about this album is... From a performance standpoint, it is amazing. It is an 8 out of 10 hmm. from a performance standpoint. Okay. All the guys from Metallica are in really good shape. Uh, the San Francisco Symphony is one of the best orchestras in the world, so it actually produces something really interesting. Where the problems start is the Chase Center. Chase Center is one of those places that was created for sports. So it is one of those places where it's really great to mass huge amounts of people. Yeah. But when it comes to acoustics, not so bad, not so great. Uh, I mean, there's a reason why Pavarotti got lapidated towards the end of his career when he did arena tours. Arenas don't sound that great, especially for classical music. A little too much echo. It's yeah, a hard true. surface. But that being said, for this four album set, it is... Four albums? For, yeah, it's a four album God. set. Wow. Uh, I think it's two CDs, though. Uh, but it doesn't matter. matter. It's like eight vinyls. That's a lot of music. This is two shows, you said? Yeah, it's the best of two shows. Uh, oh, so That's a marathon. Originally, it was supposed to be only the September 6th show. Uh, it was so successful, I think they sold out within hours or even minutes. Uh, and so they had to do an encore and the, the recording is actually a best of, of those two nights. And... You, you feel the energy from the public. People are really getting into it. And there's even a 16-page booklet that includes additional context. The vinyl itself is immaculate, at least uh, in most copies, which is starting to be a serious problem with a lot of albums out there, but this is not the case. What do you mean immaculate? Like depressing? I, depressing is immaculate in the sense that it's not dirty. There's, there's more and more of a problem. I know the last Ozzy Osbourne... Yeah. almost every copy was dirty or wobbly and okay, they had a yeah, lot of issues. Yeah, yeah. So I'm lucky then because mine was a UK pressing when I got mine of The Ordinary Man. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but the US pressings had a lot of problems. I got uh, lucky, yeah. So this is not the case here. It sounds really good. It, it, I mean, the sound itself, if you are very anal about this, these types of things, it, it is not, of course, the same as a studio album. That, that being said, if you get a good copy and if you don't, if you are, if you understand the limitations of the medium, it is a good album. And if you're a metal fan, vinyl, seriously, you have to try it at least once because the bass on a vinyl, there's just something magic about it. Uh, although, as Kennedy here will attest, there is a slight lim physical limitation with vinyl. For example, if you listen to ACDC at, what were you listening to, at like 13 on the knob or, <laughs> or oh, yeah. 20? Like... With the, uh, it was the Thunderstruck uh, album, I, uh, Razor's Edge album. When it came to Thunderstruck, I, I made my record player jump because I, yeah, yeah they're, 
and so what? Who cares? Whatever. I, I did it on purpose to test it and yeah, just to show prove a point. Well, that's why you have to move your speakers out in your front lawn. Right. Yeah, exactly. that's pretty well. Yeah. It won't skip and your neighbors will enjoy your music. Well, that's it. But that's the thing. Yeah, it does skip. You get in certain albums, they're, they're loud. And metal is, is no exception. Sure, exactly. So this is one of those albums, if you like metal, if you like classical, or if you like both. There is something on there for everyone. And it works. It as weird as it is, it works. Okay, excellent. That's it's excellent. You know what? It, it doesn't surprise me that Metallica sells out, because no. they're one of those unique metal bands. I find that when they came out, I think it was eighty five or eighty six. Yeah. yeah. They they just they just went. You know, they released stuff like Master of Puppets. That album uh, has got some few songs that are long, but at the end of the day, like they're popular, and they, yeah. I think they they took metal. In a more likable stage, if that's even possible. Yeah, that's the way of putting it. Yeah, they were they were reliable. One of those reliable bands, like ACDC. You you know what you're getting. You're not gonna say, "Wow, where did this come?" From? No, you kind of know what you're getting. We, we, you spoke. Of, you've been speaking about Van Halen. Van Halen was never uh, that way. They weren't totally stable. Like they did introduce organs and electric piano. What the hell's going on? It wasn't just Eddie playing Eruption for ten minutes. They had uh, they introduced stuff, so they were unpredictable. Some bands, just you know, it's coming down the pipe, and they often do. They have long careers, right? Exactly. And you could tell which bands had some drug issues. And which one, <laughs> no, and, and which ones don't. Yeah. As a friend of mine I went to high school with, and he always wrote on his sneakers with a white part. He had wrote Metallica on one side and Skid Row on the other. And I asked him, <laughs> I said, "Elder, why do you have that?" He goes, "These are two bands that I know for a fact that don't do drugs and drink booze all day." So Skid Row is one of those yeah. bands that actually were known for being clean mm -hmm. and hence with Metallica. Mind you, he's a huge Metallica fan, so he obviously <laughs> <can't> support, the, <laughs> <laughs> support the latter, right? So, and you have to admire these guys because back then, air metal was really oh, yeah. what was selling. And they, they just stayed, like, they, they were these dirty punk, they, punk kids. They were both guys. Yeah. Exactly. They're great guys. So that's a fantastic review, Wheeler. And yes, get the s and 2 on vinyl 180 gram UK pressing. Exactly. <laughs> so... Here we are now with the latter part of the show for Facts with Van Halen. So, I will fire them off. Uh, make sure you have your ears open for this one. Duh. So, Eddie Van Halen could not read music sheet. From his first piano lessons at the age of six, Eddie's penchant for musical performance was clear. He would painstakingly memorize his teacher's finger movements, developing his ear and playing until he could hear a record and replay it note Per note, Eddie claimed that many years went by before anyone suspected he could not read sheets of music at all. Uh, the band is listed at number two as the Guinness Book of World Records. <clears throat> in the spring of 1983, Van Halen headlined the U.S. Festival in San Bernardino, California. They performed on Heavy Metal Day for the stratospheric fee of $1.5 The Guinness Book of World Record created an all-new category just for them, the highest paid single appearance of a band. What do you think about that? I think it's fantastic. One point five million, and yet Blues Fest paid eighty grand for Dave Matthews. <laughs> and that's one point five million. Nineteen eighty four. Eighty three. Yeah, Eighty three. So we put it uh, in. So it's probably almost double now. Well, for Van Halen, yeah, absolutely, or any kind no, of legendary band. No, no, I meant, no. I meant from the the value of the one point five. Yeah, the oh, yeah, pretty well. Uh, number three. Alex and Eddie Van Halen were the only consistent members. Others included David Lee Roth, Michael Anthony, Sammy Hagar, Gary Sharon, your good old buddy Ian Mitch Malloy, Mark Stone, and Wolfgang Van Halen. Number four, they have not always been known as Van Halen, starting out as the Broken Combs. They later became the Space Brothers, the Trojan Rubber Company, and then Genesis. Upon finding out the latter name was already taken, they changed their name yet the again <laughs> to Mammoth. Finally, in 1974, the band officially landed on Van Halen, although both Daddy Long Legs and Van Hagar were also considered. Uh, Gene Simmons produced the band's first demo tape. Go figure that one out. Yeah, it's just bizarre. Again, it's not an album, it's a demo tape. Uh, number six, Eddie Van Halen started off as a drummer. When the brothers started out together in the 60s, 
And he played the drums while Alex was on guitar. But he found he couldn't play Eruption on the snare. So. <laughs> <laughs> and Eddie only suggested they switch instruments after he found out his older brother had been secretly playing his drum set while he was at work. Son of a... Uh, 1984 went platinum five times after one year being released. Stylized as 1984 in Roman numerals, Van Halen's sixth studio album garnered national praise. It was David Lee Ross. Last album with the band until 2012. And he kind of had a feeling when he was on Letterman talking about his solo career. Yeah. And it just, you know. Time to go. Bickering yeah. was going, you know. Yeah, I know. Uh, number eight. David Lee Roth left the band to make a movie. Roth's departure from Van Halen was partly so that he could take a stab at the movie business. CBS Studios reportedly gave the musician $10 million to write, direct, and star in Crazy from the Heat. I thought it was the Magic Christian King. Yeah, really. That's, <laughs> nice That's right. A film that shared the name with Roth's debut solo album. Unfortunately, the project folded. Uh, the album, 5150, was named after a police code based on the California Welfare and Institution Code, 5150, which refers to a mentally disturbed person. Number 10. A college student was expelled for writing an essay on Hot for Teacher. In 2011, Oakland University student Joseph Corlett penned a thesis about his professor based on the racy song. When the school acted, 56-year-old Corlett sued them for $2.2 million, claiming they violated his Those rights to free speech. No, no. <laughs> uh, number 11, Sammy Hagar wanted to name the ninth album The F Word, wanted to address America's hot-button issue of the time. So censorship was not in his... Uh... Yeah, either was really intellect. Peter, <laughs> and the cover would have been a middle finger, probably. Probably. Uh, oh, the, gu yeah. the guitar term brown sound, not brown sugar, like you would have thought <laughs> Rolling Stones, oriented from Alex's drum playing. Uh, 80s unique guitar tone has garnered significant repute in the rock and roll world. In one interview, he said his goal was to sound like Alex's snare. Warm, big, majestic, and brown. This description clicked with the guitar players and the term is widely used today. Number 13, to generate the intro to Pound Cake, Eddie had held a power drill to his guitar pickup. Apparently the scenario was a complete fluke. A maintenance worker accidentally left the tool in the studio and upon picking it up, Eddie realized it was the exact same key as the song. He uses that very drill every time Van Halen plays Pound Cake live. You have to love the fact that pound cake is both a delicious dessert and sounds quite dirty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jump was Van Halen's one and only number one. Uh, the, their most famous song, the synth-heavy pop hit Jump, supposedly took only one day to finish. It leapt to the top of the Billboard Hot 100, earned Van Halen a Grammy nomination, and was listed by Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum as one of the 500 songs that shaped rock and roll. Number 15, Eddie is listed as the inventor of three U.S. patents, the most exciting being a supporting board which attaches to the back of the guitar, holding it parallel to the floor during a performance, the perfect position for his famous finger tapping techniques. Number 16, fact right here, Michael Anthony played bass on all the band's 12 studio albums. Correct. Long-time standing member Michael Anthony has been the band's bass player um, from the beginning and has recorded and played bass on all their studio albums before the surprise firing. Number 17, Van Halen asked for a bowl of M&Ms with all the brown candies removed before every show. The band concert writer indeed had a clause saying there could be no brown M&Ms in the backstage area or the promoter would forfeit the entire show at full price. As lead singer David Lee Roth explained in a 2012 interview, the bull of M&M's was an indicator of whether the concert promoter had actually read the band's complicated contract. And the last fact for all you people that wonder why I like David Lee Roth so much, well, if you love animals, David Lee Roth is an avid dog lover. Roth has a ranch where he works with herding dogs. Thank you for everything you want to have been Halen, but we're afraid to ask. And what's you hear any cocktail music in? No, again, I hear it's coming through. But... And now, yes or no with Ferris Kennedy, the segment where the sick 
drug-addled mind of Mr. Kennedy forcibly asks Dr. Clark and medicated Wheeler yes or no questions about classic rock and you get to hear the sick, drug-addled answers. Makes my knees freeze. Okay, what do we got today? All right, we're going to start off with Wheeler. Okay. Oh, yeah. Bruce Springsteen and E Street Band started playing at venues on the Jersey Shore. Yes or no? Be careful, it'll cost your life. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but not a TV show. Excellent. The Clash is a UK band that became referred to as the only band that matters. They refer to themselves that yes. way, but yes. Uh, Rush was founded in Tilsonburg, Ontario. I once said maybe that, I think, but no. You're correct. It's in Willowdale, Dude, right? Here. Willowdale, Ontario. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sounds like something out of an Archie comic. Yeah, it does, yeah. Uh, ZZ Top was founded in El Paso, Texas. Great name for an album, El Paso, but no. All right, it is Houston. Uh, Deep Purple was originally known as Roundabout. Yes. And uh, Craftwork, the band Craftwork, in English, that word means power station. It does, but you... you... It would work better with Power Tool. But it yeah. also means kill all the little people. <laughs> uh, and the band Yes, they were actually founded in London. I would say yes. Excellent. Clarky. How may I help you? Frank Sinatra's hit, My Way, was yes. actually written by Paul Anka. Yeah, it's debatable, but I, for the sake of this program and the continuity, I'm going to say, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Katie Seagal. The actress was a backup singer for Bob Dylan, Bette Midler, and Etta James. Yes or no? No, she was an action star. Remember all that Kung Fu stuff? You had a point. Oh, that's Steven. Oh, you're right. You're right. <laughs> uh, the Patti Smith Group album Horses was led by a musician poet. She also didn't shave her armpits. It was a big deal. Thing. <laughs> she did. True story. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, David Crosby was in The Birds and was the rhythm guitarist and vocals. Yes or no? Yes, until they fired him. <laughs> They did, for being awful. Uh, Me and Bobby McGee was a hit by Janis Joplin, and it was released in the 1960s. Oh, you lied through your teeth. It was released in 1970, written by Chris Christopherson. Dwayne Allman sat in on Clapton's Layla after meeting him at a Miami concert. That's true, and uh, Clapton was first aware of him when he was listening to a version of Hey Jude by Wilson Pickett, and Allman was on there. He said, who's the guitar player? I gotta meet him. Here's some trivia. Uh, in 1968, recording of In Gata the Vida <laughs> was 27 minutes long. Yes or no? I'm going to say yes because I'm a dancing fool. <laughs> it's actually 17 oh, come on. minutes. Yes. <laughs> For continuity, folks. Okay. And what was the story with that song? The story was that the guy wrote it originally called In the Garden of Eden. He told his buddies in the band, but everybody was so stoned. They either heard it or he said it. In the Garden of Eden. And his buddy said, that's great. Write that down. In the Garden of da Vida. Hey. And that's why it makes no sense. In the Garden of Vida, baby. I love you. Nothing. Nonsense song. That's all I have for yes or no. That's beautiful. Thanks very much. And that's all the time we have today. So thank you for tuning in for the life and times of David Lee Roth on this podcast. <laughs> the... And Van Halen too. Oh yeah, Van Halen also. Oh, but yeah, it's, yeah, he's in it. it's on the David biography Roth. channel. On the biography channel. But uh, please uh, do find us at uh, capcitybeats.com. We are streaming there on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. And the Rewind Sundays at 10 a.m. Excellent. Please email us any suggestions at thefairiswheelshow at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under the Ferris Wheel Classic Rock Show. So signing off to the right of me. Stephen Wheeler. To the left of me. Dr. Ian Clark. And, and you are? Ferris Kennedy. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Teenage savages go wild in a juvenile jungle of lust and lawlessness. <laughs>